Sayın konuklarımız ilk konuşmayı yapmak üzere Accenture Yönetim Danışmanlığı Strateji Başkanı Mark Sperman'ı az sonra sahneye davet edeceğim. Yüksek büyüme oranlarına sahip pazarlardaki fırsatlar ve Türkiye başlıklı konuşmasıyla gelecek vizyonunu bizlerle paylaşacağız. Konuşmasını yapmak üzere Sayın Mark Sperman'ı sahneye davet ediyoruz. Please welcome Mr. Mark Sperman. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at this uh, very important meeting and a great pleasure to be in Turkey because I think Turkey is one of the great stars as we look at uh, emerging markets. Uh, and one of my great uh, pleasures at Accenture is to be able to travel around the world and to look at different countries and see how the global stage is changing. And if there's one message that I want you to take away from my comments, it's about a decade of transition. And what I'd like to do in my comments and remarks this morning is talk to you about partly the uncertainty that exists in the global economy, but a lot about the opportunities that exist within a decade of transition. And at Accenture, we employ something like 240,000 people around the world and so we're very conscious as an organization which is based on talent how do you manage on a global stage and so I want my remarks really to split into three components I want to talk about context the context of the global stage I want to talk about emerging markets but I want to unpack emerging markets I want to look at emerging markets at a number of different levels I want to look at trade, I want to look at exports, I want to think a little bit about what's whole happening in terms of income and what does that mean in terms of consumption patterns and then we'll end up talking about some business implications. So context first, then we'll talk about emerging markets and some of the key issues and then business implications. That's the structure that I'd like to follow over the course of the next half an hour or so as I talk to you. I'm going to present some slides, but you've also got on your chairs a copy of the report. So there's more detail in the report if you'd like to look at some of the, the detail and some of the numbers. So let me start with context. If you look at the global stage today, there's a lot of people who will talk about what's happening globally in terms of economics. And you can look at different growth rates. And there are other people who look at what's happening in particular industries. And they will talk about what's happening in terms of the trends within those particular industries. But what I think is very important at the moment is to be able to bring together the economic insights together with the business insights to be able to understand what's happening at the macro level, the macroeconomic level, and relate that down to the micro level. What does that mean in terms of how I run my business? What are the ways that I'm going to deliver excellence in that business? And today in a world where we talk a lot about uncertainty and we talk a lot about volatility, it's important as business leaders to be able to relate economics with business, macro with micro. Now, one of my first key messages is that a lot of people today talk about uncertainty. But uncertainty is not the same as volatility. We talk about uncertainty as it relates to growth rates. But that's different from volatility, where we talk about things like bottlenecks. So if you look at the Straits of Hormuz, and there's a problem with the delivery of oil through the Straits of Hormuz, you get a bottleneck. The bottleneck creates a price spike in, for example, oil, and therefore you get volatility in the oil price. But what I would also say to you is that although there is a lot of uncertainty and volatility, there are a lot of factors in the global economy which are also very, very predictable. 
And I think it's worth bearing in mind that as we think about the global stage, yes, there is some short-term uncertainties, but there are a lot of longer-term trends which are very predictable. And what I want to try and do is explain what some of the predictable trends are, as well as explain what some of the shorter-term uncertainties are. The other thing that I'd like to do is just as we look at the stage of emerging markets, recognize that a lot of the trends come back to understanding drivers of growth and drivers of debt. And if you look at countries today, a lot of the growth really relates back to commodities and commodity prices and demographics. Because if you look at a world which is growing, and we talk a lot about the world going from 7 billion to 9 billion, but the really interesting thing is actually it's the 1 billion that's going to come into the global stage over the next 15, 16 years. If you look at that population growth, we get some trends in terms of what's happening to the demand for commodities, and on the other side, we have changes in consumption patterns which are driving demand for new products and services. So a lot of the growth, the way that you interpret what's happening in countries, relates back to understanding some of the key drivers of growth. But on the other side, we've got a lot of countries which have basically got fundamental debt problems. And when we talk about debt, it's very important to remember that debt is partly about public sector debt, i.e. government debt, but it's also about the debt in the corporate sector, and it's also about household debt. So when you hear people talk about what's going on in Europe, you have to remember different countries have different levels of debt. So if you take Spain, the reason why Spain at the moment has particular problems is because it has a combination of public sector debt, of personal debt, and of corporate debt. If you look at France, France has high public sector debt and high corporate debt, but actually lower personal debt. Italy, too, has high public sector debt, but lower personal debt. So when we talk about what's going on in terms of these economies, it's important to understand the profile of the debt as well as where the growth opportunities are going to come from. So growth and debt are good indicators of where the potential are for growth and problems in the future. Let me just say one thing about the, or two things about the euro. There's been far too much discussion about the euro in terms of the financials and the bailout. The bailout is necessary, but not sufficient. The really important issue in Europe is actually around structural competitiveness. And the key question for Southern Europe is can they address the underlying competitiveness issues that exist in some of those southern European countries? That is the big exam question for the next two years. And so when you listen to the European debate, it isn't just about the bailout. It's really over the next two years, is the structural competitiveness issues going to be addressed, particularly in southern Europe? And that's the exam question. And the third question, which will be the slightly more longer-term question, is whether Europe is able to put a governance structure in place which can address an EU-17 working in the context of an EU-27. So these are part of the shorter-term challenges which are addressing particularly Europe and the near area. But the thing that I, d I think is very important is that the newspapers and the media get very focused on those short-term uncertainties and some of the issues around short-term volatility. What I'd like to argue, though, is the real issues, I think, particularly as business people, to, run, to understand, is the transition that's taking place and the speed of that transition. So what is actually happening is that the crisis which started in 2008 and 2009 is actually accelerating changes in the economic power base around the world. And that is one of the reasons why this is a decade of transition. So let's put those short-term context issues into a longer-term context. And the longer-term context comes back to some of the issues around economics, 
around politics, around what's happening with demographics, what's happening with technology, and what's happening with the energy and environment. And remember that whatever happens with the euro, the fundamental issues around the global economy are still around essentially structural imbalances. That means that the trade flows are creating large amounts of dollars, particularly in Asia. Those dollars have to flow back into the global economy. And what I would suggest is when you combine those structural imbalances with sovereign wealth funds, the accumulation of dollars because of commodities, what is going to happen is that that's going to create changes, particularly in terms of ownership of assets in the developed world. And that is going to happen irrespective of what happens with the euro. In terms of politics, on a global stage, this is a decade where there is going to be no clear political leadership at the global level. There are going to be discontinu discontinuities. Why? Well, because if you think about it like this, the G20 is efficient, but not legitimate. Because it represents 20 countries, not 190. The United Nations is legitimate, but not efficient. And so what we're going to have is a global order where you have structural imbalances, where you're going to have political gaps, particularly in terms of global governance. And you'll either look at that as a problem or actually as an opportunity. And that is why things like the Doha Trade Agreement will not get finalized. But what you'll see in its place is a lot of bilateral trade, a lot of regional trade. And that is going to be part of the way the global economy is going to move over the course of the next 10 years. Now, there are, I talked to, earlier on about some of the things that are very predictable. It's very predictable that we're going to get a billion more people in the global population over the next 15 to 16 years. It's very predictable that we're going to get the rise of big cities as engines of growth in many countries. 25 cities around the world represent, sorry, 40 cities around the world represent about 25% of global GDP. Just look at the size of Istanbul relative to Turkey and see that as the engine or one of the key engines within Turkey. But look around the world and see cities increasingly as engines of growth. And then you get into very interesting questions about the competitive advantage of cities as a magnet for being able to drive growth in different countries. We've got a technology revolution taking place. Just think about the amount of data that now exists in the world. If in 2010, the amount of data in the world was one, by 2020, it's going to be 44. That's a huge explosion of data. Fantastic amount of information about what's happening, particularly in terms of your customer base. But the question is, some companies will survive that, and some will drown in it. Some will use that information for clearer insights and better decision making, and some will drown. And so what we see is some short-term trends, particularly around uncertainty, but a lot of longer-term trends which create opportunity. And that, if you like, provides a little bit of context for what I now want to talk about is about how do you unpack what's happening in emerging markets against that context, against that sort of backdrop. So what the report that you've got shows is we went and looked at 64 countries around the world. And what I want to do is start by looking at some facts around what's happening to trade flows in the global economy. So let's just look at this first slide. And there's a lot of facts and figures on this slide. But the critical thing that you need to look at is what this slide is showing you is what is happening to trade during the course of the period, the 10-year period from 2000 to 2010. And nearly every single major trading area, if you look at what's happened to emerging market to emerging market trade, 
It's grown by about 15 percentage points, with the possible exception of Africa, which is a bit smaller. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that what we're seeing is emerging market countries trading more and more with other emerging market countries and less with developed world countries. And that's a very important, I think, trend to note and see what's happening. So if you look at a country like Brazil, so whereas Brazil's largest trading partner used to be the United States, now it's China. If you look at a country like South Africa, South Africa used to trade a lot with Europe. Now it increasingly trades with countries in Asia. It trades with countries like Indonesia. It trades more with countries like, like China. And so what we're seeing is a big growth in emerging market to emerging market trend, uh, trade. And I think for a country like Turkey, that is also hugely important. Because as you think about where are going to be the growth opportunities going forward, thinking about those trade patterns and where they're going become very, very key. Now, if you look at the global economy, the global economy has a very clear rhythm. And the clear rhythm is what I call 246. So the global economy, the developed world grows at 2%, the emerging world grows at 6%, and the overall global economy grows at 4 That is a pattern that we've seen over the course of the last decade. Now, 2012 is very predictable, because the emerging world is going to grow at 6 but the developed world, because of the problems it's got with debt, is only going to grow at 1 and so the global economy will grow at 3 so instead of the normal rule of 6, 4, and 2, 6%, 4% overall, 2% in terms of the developed world, this year it's 6, it's 3, and it's 1. Because of the debt problems, particularly in the developed world. Although, interestingly enough, remember that half the growth, half the growth in the global economy this year will be in the United States and China. Half of all the growth in those two key countries alone. And the interesting thing to remember about the United States is that although I think the big questions about the United States will be 2013 and 2014 because of the issues about their budget and their financial position, remember that the United States have got two big things going for them. One, they're going to benefit from low energy prices because shale gas is giving them a competitive advantage in terms of energy prices. And gas prices in the US are lower than Europe and are lower than Asia. That is going to be a competitive advantage, particularly when the United States becomes self-sufficient in energy around about 2015 and 2016. The other big advantage that the US has still got is they've got some demographic upside. So although I think the picture in the United States is mixed, I still think the United States have got some advantages. And as they're 25% of global GDP, they remain very important. But as you look at this map and you understand the trade flows, think about what's happening. So look at Latin America. Look at a country like Brazil. And if you want to understand what's happening in these trade flows, always remember it comes down to consumption, investment, and exports. So if you look at a country like Brazil, why has growth come off a little bit in Brazil? Well, the answer is you've got high inflation, high interest rates. That dumps down consumption. You've got investment going into pro programs like the Olympics and the World Cup. And their exports are slightly off because of some of the issues around less demand for their raw materials, but a lot of their agricultural products are selling well. And so as you look at a country like Brazil, you can begin to see, when you look at their consumption, their investment, and their exports, what their prospects are in terms of their growth rates. And you can go around that map, and you can look at different countries and different sort of ways in which their trade flows are changing. So let's take, that, let's take this to the next level. So if there are trade flows where we're seeing more trade between emerging market countries in emerging markets, uh, countries as well. Let's look at uh, three countries. And the first one that I'd like to look at is India. So what this shows you is cumulative, this is cumulative exports 
for the decade 2000 to 2010. Cumulative exports. And the number I just want you to, or the numbers I want you to focus on is look here at where their trade is relative to Europe. So these are the European countries. Focus on this one. 49 billion is the amount of trade India has done with the United Kingdom. 49. But look, 50 billion to Singapore, 52 billion to Hong Kong, 72 billion to China, 126 billion to the United Arab Emirates. This is examples of emerging market to emerging market trade. So what you're beginning to see is the importance, particularly of regional trade. So that is India in terms of its trade pattern. Now let's look at another interesting country, which is Indonesia. So Indonesia is 240 million people. 240 million people. Half of the population, 120 million, are under 29. 42 million using Facebook. And when you look at how the Indonesian economy is moving, what you see again is very strong flows around the region. And Indonesia is growing at something like 7% and will continue, I think, to grow at that sort of rate. Obviously, big trade with Japan and the United States. But again, you get a sense of where their trade flows are and their trade patterns. Now, how does that compare with Turkey? So this is the trade exports for Turkey over the course of the last 10 years. And so what you see here, I think, which is very interesting, is a very strong orientation towards Europe, which is what one would sort of expect. But the beginnings of signs, clearly, big trade with places like the Russian Federation, which is growing. So the question that I would have for you is that in a, tr in a world in which we're seeing emerging markets growing much more rapidly, what does that mean in terms of the types of exports that you should be doing and the destinations that you should be focusing on? And remember what I said. India exported 49 billion over 10 years to the UK. One of the things I like to say to my UK audiences is, Turkey exports more to the UK than India. What does that tell you about the types of trade relations that the UK should be having going forward? And I think there are things like that that countries need to be thinking about. And my key question for you is, in a world of emerging markets, where should Turkey be focusing as part of its next wave of growth over the course of the next uh, 10 years? So I've talked about trade, I've talked about exports. I'd like to talk next about household income. So if we could just talk about household income. The key issue here is that when you look at household income, what we're doing is the household income here is around 41 billion. It's going to grow to 56 billion. And as we look at that 15 million, or sorry, 15 trillion in terms of growth. A very large amount of that is going to occur in emerging markets. So what we see is household incomes growing significantly in emerging markets. And if you break that down, what we've done is we've broken this down into various income bands. And this is just one example. So if you think about household income, under $5,000 to $15,000, $15,000 $15 $15 to $30,000, $30,000 to $50,000, $50,000 and above. The way to think about it is like this. In Turkey today, you have 18 million households. 18 million, and you have roughly about four people in every household. Today, under 30,000 is roughly about 12 million. Over 30,000 is about six. Now, what is going to happen in the next decade is that that is going to flip. So that in the next decade, what we're going to find is that we're going to have six million households under 30,000 and 12 million over 30,000. That is a dramatic shift in how spending power is going to shift in this country. And that is just one example of 64 countries 
where we've looked at the household income patterns. So remember, what does that mean in terms of consumption? Because if you've got 12 million households under 30,000, moving to 12 million households earning over 30,000, what does that mean for consumption of cars, consumption of uh, retail products, consumption of uh, consumer products? You're going to see big, big changes in terms of consumption, pro of consumption uh, of products. And that, I think, is part of understanding how the emerging markets are, ch are changing. So what I've just taken you through is emerging market trade is growing, export patterns are changing, household incomes are growing, particularly quickly in emerging markets, and that is driving changes in consumption patterns. And just to finish, what that means, I think, is in terms of business implications, is the following. First and foremost, companies need to think very carefully about how they position themselves, particularly in emerging markets. It's not just about the market position, but it's also about your employee proposition. Because when you think about how you position in the country, it's not just about how you position in terms of the products and services that you sell, but it's your attractiveness as an employee. The second thing that becomes very important is thinking about how you segment your customer groups. And the data, which I explained given by technology, accessing that data to target customer groups is going to be hugely important. And the other thing that we're going to see is many more new competitors emerging. Because if you look at the top 500 companies today in the world, 117 of them already come from emerging markets. So we're going to see more and more new competitors. And then what that means in terms, I think, of capabilities within the organization is better ability to manage data, better ability to engage with local stakeholders, communities in local markets, and critically down here, greater flexibility within organizations, recognizing that you need to have different operating models in different parts of the world. And so what I've tried to do in this sort of short time that I've got with you is give you a sense of context. We have a world that's moving very quickly, a world that is partly uncertain, but a world that's also very predictable, a world which I think is in transition. We have a situation where we see very clearly a lot of changes in terms of emerging market trade. That is going to create opportunity through changes in consumption. But I think it also creates some challenges for business because the historic ways that we've thought about our business models will become more complex as we serve more markets, as we serve both domestic strength, but as we also look to grow internationally. And so what I hope I've done is create a little bit more thoughts for you about some of the key issues that are worth thinking about in terms of how you organize and run your businesses as we look as a decade of transition. And remember, you have to balance the uncertainties with the clear opportunities that exist uh, going forward. So with that, thank you very much indeed, and we're going to go from there to our panel discussion.